what is it? Subscribe, hit the bell, and thumbs up. <laughs> okay, let me do that again. Let me do that again. <laughs> I like that one better. <laughs> My idea of a college student, my idea of party was like you just get drunk and you drink also whatever is offered to you at the party. Right. So, <laughs> and, yeah. all, and, and anything else offered to you at the party. Uh, it was almost like bedtime and at like four in the morning. And a lot of people who were at the party were kind of finding the spot here and there to crash. I mean, I was coordinating with my host. I was getting really frisky. I really wanted her to like sleep next to me. And I was persistent. I kept asking her and she was clearly not comfortable and she clearly didn't want to sleep next to me, but I wasn't really giving up on my ask. And at one point when I felt like, I, it makes no sense now, but like, I, I felt like this, I didn't have any chances at that point. I reached and kissed the back of her neck. I have a lot of shame around this. Every mm. time I've thought about this, this is like over a decade ago. And every time I think about it, I am filled with shame. You know, she, she, she was uncomfortable, she declined, and she left. I wrote her a day or so later, and she wrote back very politely. And, you know, I knew I had done something wrong. I didn't even have the language really to offer a good apology, to even do a good process of accountability. I really, you know, by the time I had the, had the sense and the awareness of the potential impact of what I had done on her, I didn't have a way to contact her again. I needed to do more. Like I also go back to it as like, what the fuck was I thinking? What was, was I doing? And I was like, that's, that's really the only thing I knew how to do. Mm -hmm. I really thought at that point in my life, the way you show interest in others and the way you initiate a connection with someone you're interested in is by getting drunk and getting them drunk and then moving on them and then just seeing how things go. Yeah. And how did I learn that? I learned that from my own abuser at the time who literally did that <laughs> to mm -hmm. me. Eight years ago, I threw a play party, private kind of small play party uh, for people of color. It was probably like maybe 10 of us. 10 of us who, you know, got in a circle, told, talked about boundaries and things like that and, and said, hey, let's have fun. Usually when I throw a play party, I say, you know, be careful about how much you drink because you, know, you want to be able to make sure that we're negotiating. Well, I got really drunk at my own play party, which I have never done before. I mean, really, really, really drunk. And if I'm being honest, I took a quarter tab of ecstasy. I blacked out. I do not remember anything. I remember the first probably hour of that play party. And then I wake up the next day and there is a negativity in the air by my lover at the time. Then I find out later that I crossed, I crossed their boundary. And I was like, oh my God, I have built my life on talking about negotiation and communication. This is about my healing. And here I am getting blackout drunk and crossing somebody's boundaries. I call my friends and I say, this is something that happened. They haven't given me all the details. I'm terrified. Uh, my friends gave me good advice. One of which was stop drinking for 10 days, go to an AA meeting and then assess after that, which I did. Uh, I found out that I spoke aggressively and then afterwards I just passed out. Um, so it didn't go any further, but still I, did, I, cro I broke my own rules at my own play party. Mm -hmm. I got drunk, I interrupted a scene, you know, so all of the things, I was wrong, 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 totally. I still was feeling so angry at myself because I could have raped someone. I could have, and just because of the could have, it, it, it just fucking, it freaked me the fuck out. After the 10 days of going to AA, um, I decided that I was gonna stay. And it's been eight years and I've been sober since because it scared the living shit out of me. If I did a blog post about it and every time I had a play party, I owned up to it and said that I would no longer drink at parties and that I would be very attentive to others that were drinking so that I could make sure that nothing was happening. I think just about anybody 
harms others. When you sense yourself that you have harm, that you have hurt, and you can identify the conditions and the reasons and the explanations. What brought you to that point, mm -hmm. to that very low point of hurting or harming others? What you do at that point about it is, I think, what sets apart the trajectory of if mm -hmm. you become an abuser versus, well, you did harm, you did your process of accountability, you did your actual true apologies, and, right. and you actually grew, you actually grew out of that experience to be someone who is actually more healed, I would say. Like that process mm -hmm. can be healing by itself. In the case of my abuser, every time I would complain about why she was abusive towards me, at best, if it was any admission that, that the thing that had actually happened had happened. And usually it wasn't, so the emotional abuse, like again, the invisible harm, I couldn't even complain about, but it was mm -hmm. the visible harm is like, you beat me. Mm. You fucking sexually assaulted me. Like, what the fuck was that? She would use excuses of like, mm -hmm. oh, I was, so, I was just so drunk. Or like, I had just smoked so, so much weed. I was having my PMS. This medication I'm taking makes me feel mm -hmm. like this way, that way. I will, of course, it was enough for me at that time to be like, oh, poor you. You know, it right, wasn't right. you. I, it was, yeah, of course, it was a you. It was the medication. It was the, you know, the PMS. Mm -hmm. You know, sure, it wasn't you. But it continued. And it wasn't until much later when I was like, you know what? If I am the kind of person who, when I drink, I can potentially harm others. Mm -hmm. I need to take a really close look at whether I should be drinking or how much I should be drinking right. or what conditions I'm putting myself in that I'm harming others and really like dig deep and make sure that doesn't, it's my responsibility to make sure it doesn't happen. So that's a difference between to me an excuse and an explanation because it's, it's used a lot and the boundaries between the two become so blurry. Like we yes, have as a society, yes. especially around drinking, as a society, we've come to a place where we accept so much from drunk people. You know, I think, I think I'm a harmer who doesn't look like a harmer, <laughs> you know, doesn't appear to be a harmer. Uh, and that I think a lot of people would say, oh, that's, that's not harming. That's, you know, that's just growing up or, or that's just, um, you know, it's just being human. And I think harming is being human, right? You know, the harms that I've done have not been sexual. Uh, they have been emotional. And, but they, I, they come out of my survivorship in that I get really activated around certain things that scare me. I'm mostly, like with my son, he starts to talk about certain things that make me anxious. And they don't have to be sexual things. They might be political things. They might be social things. And I just get really elevated. You know, I get into, you know, that like, Blah, 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 and I just go over him. So now I have this accountability space where I'm just really trying to listen to him more, even when I'm afraid and I'm clocking my activation. Like that's my whole big thing in this period, also with my daughter, who's much younger, and I've shut down a lot less than him, but she's observed me do this, right? They, ha they have a, a word for us when I, when I go Irish on someone. <laughs> Let's say, oh, mom went all Irish on that person, or mom went Irish on Riley. And, you know, I mean, I just do. I just, you know, I don't want them tiptoeing around me. I don't want them afraid of me. Oh, my God, that just, like, breaks my fucking heart. Or they're trying to act in a certain way to make sure that I don't get activated, right? So my thing now is to say, um, <laughs> we've got this thing in family therapy where they're supposed to say, are you okay if I start, right? But they forget to say it, but they get, they can see that it's happening. And I say, isn't someone supposed to ask me something? Somebody ask me the thing. And then they go, are you okay? And then it's like, oh, okay. Uh, I'm, I'm getting activated. I'm, I'll just go to my room now. I'll just stop. So, I mean, I can laugh because thank God in the last six months, you know, we're getting a lot of help and we're getting a lot of healing and I'm being more self-aware of how really, I think, you know, my survivor brain, my, my survivor instincts, like just come into play when I'm worried about them or I'm worried about something. Uh, you know, I'm at a place in my life and my own healing where I can take responsibility for my harm, especially because with them, so they're just so precious. They're just, you know, 
the loves of my life. So as a mom, there was a time when like, I just had this an epiphany, like, hey, you might be sort of verbally abusive to your kids when you're angry, not at them, at other people. In my mind, before I had this epiphany, it was just me being short with them because I was grumpy. But it's not really that. It was me being lazy, not doing the work, and projecting my anger from somewhere else onto my children because I was at home and it was a safe space to let it out. Um, and so it was my youngest kid said, hey, we didn't do it. We're going to our room. You can't talk to us like that. And like, it was like, oh, I used to say that to my dad. Oh, I need to think about what the fuck just happened. Because I have made sure that my children were far more intellectual about these things than I ever was at their ages, like much earlier. Um, so we all have our work to do. So I think I unintentionally caused harm even though i've always had an intentional way of life not to cause harm i struggled to hold my father accountable for the harm he caused me because i saw him as a human being and i didn't see him as a monster and i thought because i didn't see him as a monster and i didn't want him to rot in jail that i must not i must be in denial <laughs> or maybe what happened to me wasn't bad enough because that wasn't my reaction to what had happened to me. But I think that as I've grown older and I've learned more from transformative justice leaders, I have been able to see that like recognizing his humanity is also recognizing my own humanity and also my capacity to harm as well and the need for all of us to be accountable for the harm that we cause. One of my abusers um, was, you know, my sister was a female. People don't tend to think about that. You know, so survivors who harm, we would most likely think of a male uh, mm -hmm. survivor who would eventually harm. Males are the only ones that harm or that penises harm or penises in and of itself are harmful. You know. uh, or that harm is harm if only it's visible or if it's physical oh, or mm -hmm. if it's violent. There is that binary of, you know, if, if a man or a masculine person harms versus a woman and a feminine person harms, the ways in which each of their harms are more acceptable. Feminine people, women identified people tend to harm in more psychological, emotional ways. No, or uh, physically violent. Physically, physically violent. violent, right. right. Mm -hmm. It's not physically mm -hmm. violent, thank you, but like, no. you know, verbally abusive, emotionally right. just abusive, because that's like the ways we are shown, right. right? Like, we all have to cope with our trauma. And again, like I was saying earlier, I do actually believe every single person who harms is a survivor of something. You cannot be someone who hasn't experienced harm yourself and hasn't been traumatized as a result and harm others because harming others takes away so much from yourself that if you have any kind of connection to who you are, you can't even allow for that to happen. Mm. And that's what trauma does. Trauma disconnects right. us from ourselves. So it's like for someone mm. to even have the capacity to harm others, especially in an abusive situation where it's a chronic harming of others, that person must be disconnected from themselves. They have suffered some kind of trauma that that's how right. they're responding to it. They're trying to protect themselves in this right. really fucked up way. But that's, that's the path they've yeah. taken. I often think about people saying their stories and they say, I, I thought I was the only one. There is this like thing of feeling alone and isolated when you are a survivor. And if you have no connection, to other people, other survivors or support, you can really um, simmer in that, right? And um, feel like you're almost protecting yourself, you know, in that protection can be uh, hurtful and or harmful in the ways that you uh, interact with other people. I think that sometimes, a lot of times we can't see ourselves. And if we don't have other people around us um, um, being witness to us and our behavior, uh, we can never see it. So some, sometimes we just don't even know that we're harming because it, like we talked about before, it is something that's so enmeshed in us. And then I am so alone. And then your behaviors really replicate that, that um, harm or hurt or abuse. There's no one there to show you that, right? And so that's why I think a lot about community healing as like mm -hmm. such an important piece for, for survivors. It, completely takes away that piece of being completely alone, 
You mm-hmm. are not the only one. It takes and um, it takes it away from this idea that you are unique or your experience is unique, and it connects you with other people to get to see those patterns. Because it's really hard to see our own patterns. I mean, we could mm-hmm. easily see other people's patterns before we see our own, and that's why accountability and all that work cannot happen alone. It has to happen in community. You can't hold yourself accountable. I'm sorry, that doesn't happen. What you're describing is actually a skill that ideally we would learn in childhood. One of the things that our caregivers should be, hopefully, which is like rare, but (laughs) we need Mm -hmm. to learn from most of our caregivers don't have this skill to really give us, which is being able to be open to other people giving you feedback. How to, first Mm -hmm. of all, provide criticism in a way that is polite and respectful and receive criticism yes. so like that that process of accountability like how you how do you give a good apology how yes. do you uh, hold someone accountable like those concepts they're really basic things that mm-hmm. if you learned early in life it saves you so much trouble but yes. by the time you are you've already gone through your the hurt and the harm and the trauma you experience you've already been isolating yourself or have been isolated right your ego is already so injured you're already so insecure right and you find yourself in a place you're harming others you're so insecure you have no capacity for anyone even mentioning to you that maybe this shit you're doing is fucked up you you shut those people out you you take them out of your life uh, you don't want to hear from them. So you only yeah. surround yourself with those who just, you know, yeah, you're great. Yeah. Oh, you'll be isolated. So it's like that is, mm-hmm. and so it becomes a self-perpetuating cycle. And I really do yes. think like people fall into that and get stuck in it because how would you get out at that point? Right. Exactly. Right? Exactly. So I just keep going back to our, how we learn about relationships and how mm-hmm. we connect to one another, human connection. Uh, we have, very little skill in which to do that. We have very right. little skill in like empathy and, and what you just mentioned, all of those things, like learning that in childhood really does make a difference because you have, these are like vital skills for connecting. We don't teach those things. And then we, through trial and error, learn about relationships. And then through those things, harm and hurt happen, but right. you don't know what the something feels wrong, but I don't have the language. So, and then it just continues until there is some common understanding about how we relate to one another in a good way, how we notice things, how we speak up, right? That's another piece of it, like this fear of hurting other people's feelings and not speaking up. It's, it's still about communication. It's mm-hmm. about how we successfully transmit information and receive information to one another and share ideas uh, and feelings and emotions. And we are so deficient in that. We really are. Um, in order to really end um, the cycle of, se- or end sexual violence and the epidemic of sexual violence, we have to deconstruct the ideas of like, there is a survivor and there is a harm doer and you're either one or you're the other. And we need to understand the humanity in each of us and that all of us have the capacity both to harm and to be harmed. And that often they, they, they are the same people. It doesn't mean that we're equating all harm with each other. If we're child sex abuse survivors, like it doesn't mean that that harm that you experience is necessarily equivalent to the harm you're causing somebody else by not honoring their boundaries or not, you know, being supportive of them. Like, but, but it's harm and you're human and you're responsible and it, accountable for what you cause. What we all need and what so many people much smarter than me have been calling for is nuance within these larger conversations because, you know, we have this sort of understanding or this this saying of like survivors being more capable of causing harm or we're more likely to. And I think that it's both important to recognize that there are cycles of harm and also that like survivors are not like these broken people that are like contaminated that are destined to harm other people like yes at humans are like all humans are but like survivors are not tainted people for whom are destined to sexually abuse a child in their lives and I think that I felt that way being around kids for a long time I felt like there was something wrong with me and I was contagious and I could pass it on to them and that I wasn't going to have control over that, that I was like fated to harm a child the way I had been harmed. And now I've come to understand that 
we're all responsible for our own healing and for the action, taking responsibility for the actions that we cause, but also that none of us are like fated to harm somebody the way that we were harmed. My reaction to when I hear survivors are more prone to harm, in a lot of ways, I'm like, uh, that I want to like, no, like refute that that's a thing. It reminds me of when people are like, oh, trans people's lives are so hard and X, Y, and Z. And I'm like, no, like, please don't put the onus on trans people just living as a trans person is hard. Please flip it and put the onus on society that makes our lives hard, that puts us in danger because of like, people are just fucked up to trans people, like, acknowledge that. And I would say the same thing about survivors. It's like, because of the the rave culture that we do live in, I think that a lot of us, including myself, have been socialized to meet the needs of not only just, you know, men and masculine people, but also our abusers or our, our I'm sorry, the people that do harm. And I, I, I correct myself because I, I also want to remove myself from the idea that like there is the language of like just, yeah, this binary that exists that says like a person is either or an abuser or some or survivor. Like, I think we're trying, a lot of the people who do do transformative justice work are trying to allow for there to be nuance and allow for people to acknowledge, like, entire people's beings um, in ways that aren't carceral or punitive or stagnant in the same ways that the state replicates these logics of, like, you're a criminal forever and ever, you deserve to go to jail, and then after jail, guess what? you're going to hell. <laughs> like, <laughs> so there's this forever and ever. Like, it's like, it's all eternity. Like, you should have been good from, from day one. <laughs> you fucked up. Um, and yeah, like, I think people can't change. People can't transform. Consent, right? This idea, like, consent is sexy. Consent, consent. And even though, yeah, absolutely, I agree. But it's interesting to start the conversation at consent that gives an, an understanding that we know what the fuck we're consenting about, that we actually have the, we know the choices of consent. Uh, right. and we know how to say no. We got to step, you know, take about 50 steps back, go back to when you're adopting the child or you're giving birth to the child or you're, you know, you're raising your niece or your grandchild in those moments. That's mm -hmm. when you start talking about the stuff so that they understand how they connect with other people. We have to have a better way of connecting, which means a new idea of how relationships even occur between adults and children, that children actually have agency, that they have the power over their own bodies. Oh my God, they actually have rights. Like seeing them in a different kind of way um, and interacting with them in that way shifts a lot of things. It is a really sad thing that we are in an age where we feel like like consent is the golden standard. I'm like, no, you can consent to something or you can think consent has been established and is still hurt and harm. It's like when you set the standard for yourself at consent, that's a really, it's a really sad thing. Mm. I've had that happen to me before where I like, I've called someone, especially around like sexual situations. And I'm like, Hey, like, that kind of behavior really doesn't work for me. And the first question, oh, well, it was consensual though. Right, right. I'm like, that's not what I'm talking about. Right, exactly. Just because it was consensual doesn't mean it's all cool. We're all good. Right. So it, it is really, but, but, and then you're saying that we don't even have the skills to even get to consent. Right, exactly. <laughs> we right? don't. We don't. <laughs> No, now I'm so happy that we are talking to, to children. Like we're like, we have to explicitly teach children about consent, consent. But I see it every day, you know, like people mm -hmm. saying, you can tell people no if you don't want to hug them and things like that. But it still shows up the way we have ownership over children's bodies. It shows up all the time. We can say that, but you know, ever so often, give me a kiss, come here and give me a kiss. Even playing, even playing around. I say it like, oh, come here, baby, give me a little kiss and stuff. And I, when I say it, I think about it and I'm like, I know I'm being funny and sweet with, you know, with my grandson, but still, am I still doing the same thing?
am I, you know, pushing for him to do that? In con consent education, it's always like, oh, you know, say no. If you don't want it, say no. And it's like, that's 50%. The other really important thing is say no if you don't want to do something and make sure you're the kind of person who can take a no. Exactly. That, we have to teach like, the other side of it. Yes, yes. Look, exactly. it's, it's, you can't just teach say no. You also have to teach take no. I want to live in a society where people can freely request what they want and yes. people can freely reject because they know if they say no, the other person won't blow up. Won't right. just there won't, there won't be consequences, yeah, like out of proportion consequences right. for rejecting your body, what you don't want to happen to your body. And, and so, the question yes. would be like with your grandson, do you have the kind of relationship with him where you think he knows if you say if he says no, it will be fine, yeah, yeah, right, right, yeah, and, and he fine. has done it, he has done it because he's been exactly, like, mm, mm. and I'm like, <laughs> okay, and I leave it alone, you know, he's like, not now. And, and right. I'm glad that he can. So that makes me feel good that I know that he will be like, no, I don't feel like it. I don't want you to pick me up. And that's actually, that's a really important piece of the education he's getting. He's saying no to you, someone much older than him with a lot right. of power. And he's okay. Mm -hmm. He's fine. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Think, think about that message. Because again, like with, and we talked about this in the episode with survivors who enable is how when we raise children who don't have basic skills to soothe themselves, mm -hmm. the skills to say no or, or being c capable of hearing a no, they grow up into being harm doers or enablers. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> or both at different times. Yeah, yeah. That is, that is, yeah, yeah. So that, that comes up a lot, intent versus impact. And, and because we talked about the enabling thing, right? A lot mm -hmm. of times the, the enabling behavior is around Oh, well, he didn't mean it. Or she didn't want to do that. They didn't, right. you know, they, they, that's not how they are. And it comes down to like, well, they, yeah, yeah. They, what they did, the impact on me was really bad, but they didn't intend it, right? right? I don't know, but for me, that framework really doesn't work because I've done it as an enabler, as an enabler in recovery. <laughs> I have justified so much shit happening to me because I always saw the best in people. Because the other thing about intention is like, it's not verifiable. You don't know what someone's intentions are. Right, right. And even they themselves, like, they're, honestly, most people who harm do it unintentionally. Like, that's, mm -hmm. right? Like, most people who harm, like, you look at all the harm being done in the world. Right. Most of it is unintentional. Right. But does it matter? Yes, right. it does. But only, only, and only if that person is at a point where they decided to change something, then mm. it matters. Before then, the impact of their harm, whether or not it's intentional, it's kind of irrelevant on you and the person, and the person right. they've harmed. The, the impact is the same. But yeah, if, if they decide to change and they've been someone who's been harming unintentionally, hooray. That's right, going to make right. everything so much easier. And that's mm -hmm. going to make, make their journey a very different one from someone who's been intentionally engaging in harm. You can get stuck in that cycle of, yeah. oh, was it intentional? Or oh, what's in their heart? Yeah, was exactly. it unintentional? Was it unintentional? And, and, and as an empath, a lot of times I see the people who've harmed me. Mm. I know their stories. I yeah. see how they got there. I have empathy for that. Right. But I need to set the boundary and, and distinguish that from your trauma is real, but how you act and behave towards others, it's entirely your responsibility. If your trauma is so bad that you're mm -hmm. right now, you can only engage with others in harmful ways. You need to like seek professional help. You need to be around people who really, truly understand the scope of what they're engaging with. You need to disclose that to people so they can mm -hmm. consensually be around that kind of thing. Like there's a lot of different things right. you can do besides harming and then excusing it with your trauma. Because the harm is still harm. <laughs> it's still there. Yeah, the yeah. impact The impact is the yeah. same. And there's yeah. a saying, right? People will forget what you say. People will forget what they say, but people never forget how you made them feel. Yeah, that is so true. That is that is powerful right there because that's the damn truth. Yeah, so I mean the difference between BDSM or kink and 
abuse is abuse, right? That that is abuse because it's not it's not consensual. Somebody's doing right. it is wielding power over someone, uh, taking power away from someone without right. and them wanting it, without their knowledge, without their consent, all of that. And, and does abuse happen in BDSM? Yes, of course oh. it does. If you're not practicing your sadism with the requirements of you know, consent, and again, going back to what true consent and true mm -hmm. accountability process in place and all of that, then you're not practicing BDSM. You just, you just right. found something as a cover to, for your abuse. Exactly. Um, to me, ideally, BDSM can provide a container to be hurting versus harming. But what do we mean by that? There are different definitions, but we are understanding hurting as something temporary, something more acute, something... You, you might be triggered by something and that's hurtful. You might become uncomfortable. You might uh, feel temporary pain versus harm, which is kind of like the cro a chronic condition yeah. where you are impacted in a deep way that is extremely unpleasant, more than just a you know, temporary thing. And, and I know, you know there's not, these are not clear cut definitions, but right. being a sadist, and you would ideally pair with someone who has consented as a masochist, consenting to that. Like, to me, that's the ideal pair, right? Right. Because the masochist is in the business of harming themselves. But how about hurting yourself a little instead? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> and maybe, maybe, I'm not saying this is the only path, and maybe through that, you find some healing. If that's right. your goal, if that's the thing you're going for, maybe there's a path for you within that. Or as a sadist, how about you hurt someone who wanted to be hurt a little? Right. And instead, you also find healing and you also don't find yourself in a place of so much disconnection that you go harm. I see it as a healing path or a harm reduction approach, either, either or both. For yes. some, <laughs> for some. <laughs> and this is not a answer. Wouldn't it be wonderful if it was an answer? <laughs> Go forth, do BDSM. Do right, no harm. Right. Do no harm. Do no, do no harm. <laughs> <laughs> Only BDSM, no <laughs> harm. <laughs> but then, of course, survivors who harm themselves or harm ourselves, how does that come about? And we usually don't talk about that piece because when we say survivors who harm, we almost always think about how they've harmed others and in a very specific way. They've harmed that person violently and they've harmed that person in a sexual capacity, right? We kind of go right there. Um, and there are many ways to harm others than yourself. In my opinion, there might be more understanding when somebody is harming themselves as opposed to harming right. someone else, right? It's not like the harm you cause upon yourself stays there within the boundaries of yourself. Right, it, right. It really isn't. Like, because to uh, me, right, yeah. because to me, I always say the remedy for someone who harms others is to learn how to not harm themselves. But it's great. It's great that you, if you contain your harm to yourself, I guess it's better. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't fucking know. I don't actually know. Well, I, I, I take say, all of that back. <laughs> I say the way I, the way I harm myself through alcohol, you know, um, drinking alcohol, addicting, you know, being addicted to alcohol was harmful to myself, of course, mm -hmm. but also harmful to others because I right. was the possibility of harming someone else. Also, the way I connected with people wasn't genuine because I was drunk. It, it's just uh, cyclical, you know? Like you say, if you learn how to do things for, you know, if you know how to not harm yourself, then it will, and yeah, I stopped harming myself. I stopped mm -hmm. um, abusing alcohol. That made it a lot better. I cleared so many things for me. Exactly, and, and, and with that, with alcoholism, goes like the whole range of addictive behaviors and ways in which we engage whether and, and that's different from addictive substances so like there is that like you can have a physical addiction to alcohol to drugs to food you could have an addictive behavior around anything including sex including masturbation including watching porn including really work shopping name it including thinking yeah. sitting around and thinking too much about shit <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah like, that's me at the end of the day when you find yourself in a situation where any behavior has taken control over you, I think it's a, it's a time to think about how are you harming yourself. With addiction, as a, as a form of self-harm, it's not like the moment you realize this is happening, 
that's just the beginning of the journey because with addiction, right. your brain has literally changed to support, to perpetuate the addictive behavior. Right. And it takes a lot, and it's not just intention, it takes a lot of support. It takes a lot of regiment in place. It takes a lot more than just willpower to undo the damage you've done to yourself through addictive behavior. Do survivors harm people more? I think I want to put it in the structural context where I feel like, you know, say you are the child of a billionaire <laughs> and it's not like children of billionaires don't have sexual abuse, but say you, you've grown up in a situation where your family has been able to create an incredible fortress around you in terms of people having access to you, in terms of you being cared for really carefully with all these people who were vetted. And so you've grown up, you're a guy, uh, you know, you've been less targeted because of your race, you've been less targeted because your class affords you certain barriers to people who might. Um, and then you inherit umpty billion and you build a fortress for your family but you have total indifference to the fact that the people around you don't have access to healthcare, uh, don't have access to uh, you know, decent housing uh, because you know, the way capitalism works is some people get the billions and then the, <laughs> the vast majority of the people don't and are exposed to, uh, they're just exposed, they're out in the open. They don't have, you know, maybe their families have been busted up because of capitalism and racism and ableism uh, and they don't have parents that are there for them. So I think this idea that those of us, as I think of us as scrabbling down on the bottom with these various kinds of exposures to harmful people, harmful systems, uh, are the people causing all the harm. While again, you've got this white guy at a lovely island that he owns by himself who's giving out philanthropy, you know, whatever, chump change, um, and really not thinking about how the way his life is valued actually is a kind of violence to all these other people. I don't think we cause more harm. Nope. Don't think so. The extreme sexual harm I did to myself. And not that I'm blaming myself, but the situations that um, I was a part of, that I entered into, that all were not healthy uh, in the beginning, like in my 20s and things like not healthy at all. I also uh, engaged in behavior that was very, very risky, extremely risky. I think about mm -hmm. that now and I was like, I should be dead. Had I was having sex in places that were very dangerous. I wasn't connected to my body, to myself, mm -hmm. and the way I connected to other people. And sex was really not about me, but about what I can give. And it was the thing that I was good at. And so that's, that's how I thanked people. That's how I loved people. That's all of that. So I sexual, that was a sexually damaging to me, the trial and error and the healing practices that I was a part of you start seeing those things. You get to step back a little bit and see all of the, the ways in which you've been led, led there, you know, <laughs> like, or how you've gotten there, especially when I had my daughter, especially when she was at the age where I was doing all of that stuff and just not even being able to imagine, like I can't, could not imagine her doing those things that I was doing. It was so, so fucked up. So I'm glad that I, slowly got out of that but still there's still that that kind of pattern it was like I was doing that sexually but I was also drinking then I stopped the sexual stuff but I still drank and then I gave myself excuses to still do the fucked up things but only in this time not all the time you know <laughs> so it's, it's a process it's a real process of letting go of that stuff that trauma is in our body and then we are really fighting to figure out how to release it. And sometimes we release it in fucked up ways. And sometimes when we learn, we can release it in beautiful, beautiful ways. Mm. The, the healing circles that you were talking about, the having places where you can go through an accountability process, because I really think a good accountability process will be healing to all parties. Yeah. And that's how you break the cycle. Otherwise, the shit just goes on as it has, mm -hmm. right? As yeah. it has. Um, we are all carrying stuff from all of our ancestors going through wars and famine and sexism and racism and rape mm -hmm. and all yeah. of that. 
and and we're trying to deal with all of that on our own especially in this society where it's just we are isolated more and more that whole sense of belonging right how healing and powerful that is if you mm-hmm. can find someone in your life even one person who truly sees you who truly accepts you who can hold you accountable who you can right. be vulnerable with because yeah i mean someone who just accepts everything that you do including your harmful behavior isn't a true friend right right <laughs> it's like yeah. they can they can accept you they don't have to accept all of your behaviors right so like even having that one person creates a sense of belonging that is so healing that can really i think prevent a lot of the harm we do to ourselves and others mm-hmm. but unfortunately i mean i think aloneness especially in the us is like it's another pandemic yeah, yeah. right especially as people grow older especially men like middle aged mm-hmm. men who are alone regardless of whether or not they're married but especially the ones who are like divorced or single we are we want to hear from you we want to hear your mm-hmm. stories your comments uh anywhere social media feel free to comment on this uh video on youtube but uh, uh we want to yeah hear if you have ever harmed anyone uh, intentionally or unintentionally and uh if you can share what kind of impact there was and if there was an accountability process whether towards that came from yourself or came from other people mm. um we want to hear about it so once you do that make sure you use hashtag heal to end hashtag bad survivors um the bad survivor which one is it <laughs> hashtag bad survivors bad. Uh. I think <laughs> <laughs> hashtag caution series and hashtag survivors uh who harm okay don't forget to <laughs> subscribe hit the bell and thumbs up <laughs> <laughs> yes and there we go bad survivors is over for now <laughs> yes thank you thank you for joining us for this series thank you <laughs>